All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back um, to the TraderLine 2020 Stock Trading Conference. And here we've got Anthony Crudelli, um, futures trader and also crypto trader for over 20 years. And he's going to be sharing with us um, a bunch of his indicators, how he uses them, and all of that. So uh, feel free to, in the chat, leave some questions. Anything you got, uh, we'll be answering some along the way and also the dedicated Q&A session at the very end. So with that, Anthony, um, the floor is yours. Um, thanks for coming on, first of all. And uh, yeah, thanks, looking forward to your presentation. Me. Of course. Hey, you guys are doing an awesome job with this. I really, uh, I'm excited to be here. What's up, everybody? Uh, so today I, I wanted to talk about using traditional indicators in a non-traditional way. I just want to give you a little bit of my background um, into you know, trading, I think, in general, just to kind of understand where I came from. Um, just a quick background is that, you know, I started on the, in the pit um, and was only in the pit for six months, was a terrible pit trader, uh, once electronic right away. And uh, right, pretty much right after the E-mini S&P was launched is when I started trading electronically. And went through several years of trying to figure out how to use technical analysis because I went from being in a pit situation to a situation where, um, you know, all of a sudden now I'm, I'm having to learn how to chart. And because a lot of the skills I learned from trader friends on the floor were not really carrying over mindset wise, which we'll talk a little bit about later uh, today as well, did carry over, but actual skills of trading didn't. So I was at a pretty much a blank slate and trying to figure out how to understand technical analysis. And I went through a really long period of just looking at every single indicator out there. And I was just really struggling with, you know, how to capitalize on using traditional indicators. And I actually spent a couple of years, literally almost every single day, I think I've tried every single indicator and spent uh, countless hours trying to figure out, you know, what, uh, what indicator I could use to build a strategy on. And after all of that, I ended up going with probably one of the first ones I looked at, and that was Bollinger Bands. And I really liked Bollinger Bands. And uh, let's go to this tweet I pulled up from from John Bollinger. And he actually, I wanted you to, I wanted you to see what he, how he defines it. He says Bollinger Bands define high and low on a relative basis. By definition, prices are high at the upper band and low at the lower band. Okay, cool, right? Um, so I'm going to take you to my tweet now and let's minimize this and the pain that we sometimes feel in trading is a good thing. Our body and mind are giving us feedback on what we're doing. The development of your edge starts from that pain. And I actually put that out this morning, think about what I was going to talk about here today. So we know um, what Bollinger Band, how, how John Bollinger defines what a Bollinger Band is. Um, and I talked about how, and that tweet that the pain uh, that we go through in trading. For me, it was a lot of frustration on trying to figure out how to capitalize on using an indicator and getting, you know, a result out of, out of it, you know, using a basic indicator. I, uh, how do I make money doing this? Okay, I understand what it is, but my skill set was really um, uh, just really figuring things out, right? So it was like looking at the market, look at the environment of the day and figure out how I want to trade it. So I was jumping from indicator to indicator and it just was just not working for me. And I settled on Bollinger Bands. And actually today I pulled up a 20 period, three standard deviation Bollinger Band. That's what I use. That's the settings I like. And I want, uh, let's go back to that tweet where I said the pain of the frustration of figuring it out. So when I finally settled in on one indicator, this is what I'm going to use. This is what I like about it. I said, okay, you know, what I first started to do is what I think many people start to do is, you know, this is a 20 period three standard deviation. Like I said, you could shrink the deviation to 20 period two and be a little bit tighter. And just kind of like what, what John Bollinger says, you know, uh, this is a daily chart actually of Ethereum. Uh, I think it's a good example for what I'm doing because I've been trading off of it all year um, is when it gets to the top Bollinger band, like you see here, I'm just drawing some lines. You look at it and say, well, prices are high, right? You could see it here, you could see it there. You know, it's the Bollinger Band there. Here, it just keeps going up, you know, near the top Bollinger Bands. But really, when you look at this, it, it hits these top Bollinger Bands, but the market still goes pretty much straight up. So I should really kind of talk about like my style and, of trading is intraday. Um, so you could use this on an intraday basis as well. Um, and I am for crypto, I trade swing trading. So really futures for intraday and crypto is more swing and position trading. 
Um, but I use the same methodology throughout. And so when I looked at this, I said, or initially I was looking at it going, okay, I was just selling the, the top Bollinger Band, you know, maybe buying the bottom Bollinger Band, looking at it for, for blowouts. Um, you know, obviously this is a daily, I was using it on a shorter term time frame for my intraday stuff. And I still was just not getting anywhere. And I said, you know what, I, this is just, you know, I love this indicator. I like it because it's visually very uh, pleasing for me. It's kind of how I see the market. I can see the bands around uh, the price action. And I always like that. And I started to sit back and say, well, how do you figure out how to actually make money with this? Like, how do you start thinking outside the box? One of my skill sets have always been just figuring things out. You know, um, like I said, I mean, you, I wanted to be a trader, you figure out how to make money. You know, you want to do a podcast or you want to do this, you, you figure it out. You know, I remember my dad used to always saying to me, well, dad, I want to do this. He goes, okay, go figure it out. You know, and, and that's that mindset I carry with me. So I was looking at all these tools I had, but I'm still losing money. I said, I got to start thinking outside, outside the box. So something I noticed, uh, as all of us do, we do a lot of chart, a lot of charting, and we're watching it, and I'm drawing around this Bollinger Band here. And one thing I noticed was, along the way, when the market was going up, the market just kept hitting the Bollinger Band here, hitting it here, hitting here. But at the same time, the Bollinger Band was going up, uh, and the bottom Bollinger Band was going down, right? So as the market was going up, Bollinger Band's going up, uh, top, and the bottom's going down. And here's me, intraday, selling those, looking for little quick moves back into the market. And sometimes it will work. Sometimes I get chopped up, probably get chopped up more than I would work. But nonetheless, that's what I was looking at. And I said, you know what? From now on, I'm only going to look to be long when the Bollinger Bands are open like this uh, and the market's going up. It would only be looking to be going short if the market was going down with the Bollinger Band. So I ruled out one aspect of it and said, instead of doing what this prices are high, well, prices are high for a reason. So I started to say to myself, instead of selling where I would think prices are high, which is that psychological thinking, you know, you're saying to yourself, well, if prices are going up, they're high, you'd want to be a seller. I mean, I trade both sides of the market as a futures trader. Uh, well, okay. Well, all that did was kept getting me chopped up and I'd be missing these moves. So I said, okay, when it's going up, now you're going to think opposite. You're going to go with that. Okay. You're going to go with it until when? So once the Bollinger Band started to come back in, then that was my trigger to say, okay, now the market was basically boxed in. And that's the way I kind of felt about it. I would look at it and say, okay, Bollinger Bands are stopped going up. Uh, on the top side, the bottom ones are stopped going down. They're starting to come back up. Okay. Now I feel like it could be a two-way trade. So you start to look for mean reversion, you know, up and down market. And that's when I would actually say, okay, at this point I could start getting short. Um, all right. So once again, I ruled something else out, right? And then uh, let's go like to, to something like this, you know, where you stop something like this, where the Bollinger Bands would be continuing to go. Um, if the market were to go higher or lower and the Bollinger Bands were to continue to kind of stay within the same framework that they were in before, basically the same highs like you would see here. And then like these lows right here would be inside this low, right? So we would be, the Bollinger Bands would, the market would still be moving and maybe potentially looking to make a new high or, or a low, but the Bollinger Band stayed within the prior Bollinger Band move. And so that was also something I was looking at and saying, you know what, that's pretty interesting to me. Is that, so then I started realizing that, you know what, maybe these top Bollinger Band peaks can be resistance for a period of time. Maybe it's un, what, I would, what I was calling unfinished business. So the market was going up here. It, this peak started to come back down. Maybe it would come back up at some point and test that peak, right? And it would go up there and test it. Kind of what, like what it did right here, right? Didn't get much of a retracement, but just follow along with me. There's a, there's a whole point behind all this. So then I, I put in another layer and I said, okay, maybe I use those as resistance. So now I have basically these three rules, right? The market's going up with the Bollinger Bands. Um, and the Bollinger Bands are open like a mouth. I'm only going to be long. I'm not going to be short. Market's going down with the bottom Bollinger Band going down. Top's going up. I'm only going to be long, uh, short. Um, when they start to close in, they get boxed in. I think it's going to be a two-way market. Maybe layer some other indicators on there and trade both ways. Or maybe it's a consolidation period of time before trend continues. Um, and maybe use those top or bottom peaks of the Bollinger Bands as resistance. Okay. So what I started to do is just really put together just outside of the box thinking of what was happening within an indicator, understanding this nuance. I mean, we all had, I don't think you needed to create new indicators. 
I always say it's not the indicator, it's how you execute using the indicator. And I just wanted to be able to just get better at my execution of an indicator that I like. I didn't know that Bollinger Bands was going to be what made me money or not. I just know that visually I liked it, but I had to figure it out. How do I start making money with this? And that took me for a good period of time, um, a, a good ways where at least I went from not, I went from stop losing as much intraday to where I was starting to break even and even, yeah, creating, <laughs> turning a profit at some point. Um, and then I said, okay, you just need a little bit more structure here. You need a little bit more. You need to figure out when you should be buying, when you should be selling. Um, you know, uh, you've got the environment down now. I understood the environment. Like I said, no one, uh, what side of the market to be on, narrowed that down uh, or when it was going to be rangy. So I got through all of that. And then I created an indicator around the indicator. So I want to pull this up and I want to show you something. So this is my indicator. It's, it's free on TradingView. It's open source. I mean, I'm showing how it works today anyway. But um, And so I'm just using TradingView here to, to show it. And like I said, you can go to my TradingView page and download it or whatever it is, and you can get it for free. And what I figured out was, okay, when the market was going up or down with the Bollinger Band, let's go back to this one right here. And then market would start to revert back in. What I liked at the time was Fibonacci tools. And I liked Fibs. I think it's a tool that everybody uses when they first start to trade. They like it and they say, okay, well, what do I buy 382 back, halfway back, 618? What do I do with them, right? So what I started to do was I started to take my Fib tool and I would take my Fib tool to the top peak and to the bottom peak. And all I would do was, so this yellow line is 50%. This red line ended up being 30%. I just broke it down. I liked it to be a little bit, I liked the 30%. I actually went and got back tested. This 30% line was the one that actually worked the best for my style of trading. That's the 30%. The blue is 70%. And then the bottom is the other peak. Okay. So what did that do? That provided me with resistance points within, remember I, I said that the Bollinger Bands are boxed in. So once they were boxed in like this, so you can see right here, not a good drawer. They were, we were boxed in. And what it did was it gave me a visual representation of, okay, this 30% I would use as initially, once they started to revert back in, did they hold below this 30%? Okay, maybe they go back to 50%. And like you see right here, it held the yellow, right? Um, if it started to get back above 30%, maybe it go and complete this unfinished business at the top peak, it would do that. And once the top, um, top Bollinger Band would get above this old high right here and start to go up, then it would draw. Uh, it would wait to draw a new set of lines. So now I would consider us breaking out again. So we're getting out of that old boxed in area and we're setting new um, sets of Bollinger Bands above or below, in this case, above the previous pair. And then I would wait and wait and wait. Okay, we're in consolidation. Use yellow as my neutral, blues as support, reds as resistance or eventually support and just trade using uh, you know that. And then eventually, and this is one of the things that uh, I go back to that tweet and say, you know, I took that, that pain and one of my weaknesses was I would get into a scenario where like this right here, um, where I would look at the market right here in Ethereum and I'd say, look it, we keep going higher, market keeps going up, held this yellow again, my neutral, market's getting ready to go up and it rips up through this point right here, right? Goes right through this. And then all of a sudden these Bollinger Bands are just exploding higher. And the old me would be the guy who would just be trying to sell it. Or if I was long, I'd be just covering it just because. Uh, and I had no structure on how to hold a trade for as long as it would go. You never know how long they're going to go. Or I'd be the guy fading the move because I was pissed off because I wasn't in it. And that was a major weakness of mine. So one-dimensional markets really just crushed me. So what I started to figure out was, okay, if it gets above here and you think you're, well, let's just say I actually was in a swing position this year. I talked about this a lot in my podcast. I talk about Ethereum a lot because I've been in it so for most of this year. The market um, held here and we continue to go higher, breaking out this peak. That's a breakout move for me. And the old me, like I said, would be the one making the mistakes and selling it. This time I held and held and held until the Bollinger Band started to come back down and the top one. Uh, came back down the bottom one started to come back up and what do we do we get boxed in again you know you just keep going back to that to me now the move is complete and i look at it and i would say okay this is the point in time now where i would use this this red line as resistance and it would tell me okay uh if you're long and you've been long cover some uh, and that's what i started to do um and then i use my neutral here 
as something to say, okay, is I like the yellow as the 50%. I look at that as neutral. If we hold above this in the long-term trend, and I was still long from back here, if it fails to hold here, we could be in trouble. That's why I got stopped out uh, of a bunch of my position there. And, you know, we're stabilizing here on blue uh, now, which I've been starting to accumulate it back again. But um, you get my point. It was, once again, now all of this has stemmed from a traditional indicator, you know, you know, with Bollinger Bands. <laughs> you know, none of this is really in what John Bollinger would, would say, you know, this is how he uses it. He uses it the way he used it. Obviously, extremely successful with how he uses it. And other people may use it in other ways. But I, I wanted to, to really share with you guys today that, look, at we all go through the struggles. I mean, this, this business is tough. I mean, I had all the resources in the world. I had, every, you know, all the best traders. I had charts. I had everything. Uh, and I still couldn't figure out how to make money. And I started to have to envision how I wanted to use the indicator my way. So I just started putting things together and figuring out how I could actually structure a strategy. And that was just thinking outside the box using a traditional indicator like this. Um, so I just wanted you to know that you, you have all these tools in front of you, narrow it down to what you like and figure out a way to capitalize on the way that you see the market, the way you like it. I like support and resistance, right? I like seeing the Bollinger Bands if they're going open or shut. I could, I, I could understand the environment. It gives me a clear, a clear decision-making path versus a lot, of, you know, a lot of these tools were waiting and were reactionary. You know, for me, I like to just see, okay, right now I think we're in consolidation. I could see that visually, the way the Bollinger Bands are coming in. I could see the way it's trading at the bottom part of my area. You know, um, it just, puts everything in line for me. I know exactly what I'm looking at. Uh, and, it, and that's the way uh, I approach it. And I just wanted to share that with you guys. Richard, I know we talked about doing some questions along the way. Yeah, we've got some. If you, if you want to take some yeah, right sure. now. Fire away. Yeah, we, we got some really good ones. So first of all, um, we've got one about the standard deviation that you chose to use for this. So normally, a, lo a lot of people, I was actually taught um, two standard deviations. So it's interesting that you're using three. So can you talk a little bit about that process? Was that part of like your back testing of the strategy, the three standard deviations um, had a, was more effective? How did you come up with that number? It, because the two was getting keeping me too busy. The environment right. was changing too much. So I wanted the Bollinger Bands to be as smooth as possible. So that, that's why I went that way. And when you use this on just a shorter term chart, you know, let's just say you go to like a five minute here. So you see like with a two standard deviation, you know, it's going to be used more of the way, almost the way that John Bollinger talked about it. I mean, right. obviously I would go over his way than most anybody's way, but the point of the matter is like, you know, this, the, that would be um, more active in that type of strategy. I want to see smooth Bollinger bands because I want to be able to sit back and look at the environment. And so three standard deviation fit what I was looking for. Once again, I molded it around the way I wanted to see it. It wasn't right. necessarily a back testing thing. It was just, I could tell right away it was too busy and then four was too much. So right. that's what happened. Makes sense. And we've got another one here about position size because um, uh, Jose says um, there's some kind of, there's a large percentage move between those lines. So um, it, it might be pretty volatile in a pretty large position. So um, yeah, how, how do you do that in general? Yeah, that's a great question. So once again, it's just, it's going to come down to time frame. You know, I mean, for me on Ethereum, what I started to do this year was, you know, uh, is I wanted to be able to be long, a longer term position on my neutral. So anytime I would see that we were holding yellow, I'd be buying some, trimming some, and just trying to hold a core position. Basically, I call it trading around a core position. Right. Um, and what I was trying to do is always hold some. Uh, and in these situations, uh, I'm scaling in in a very tight area. I'm not all in. Uh, I'm just basically, you know, at all the yellows and blues uh, that you see back here, I've basically been buying them and then using reds as, as uh, selling opportunities. So if you go back and look at all these, like here, you know, like right. this one, for, this is the perfect example I'll talk about. So for me, initially, I stepped in here and I had a trim sum because the volatility just got way too much for me. I'm going, I'm going to get smoked on this stuff. Right. And then when it started to establish up there, I added, and now I've been continuing to add you know, like, like that. Um, but when we took out this low in here, you know, I, I had to, uh, it got me a little, you know, nervous. So I just got smaller and smaller. My stop will always be on this type of a position a, on a bigger time frame. will have to be a violation of, of, of a bottom blue, which I have not seen yet. Um, and that, that stop was just getting so wide for me that I also had to really trim my position because I'm going, man, this thing can go to 1200. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I'm like, whoa, you better, you better rein some in there, buddy. So, um, you know, on the shorter term, 
you know, if I go to like a five minute, yeah, it's just so different because on the five minute, like right now, I would almost just be looking to buy at the blues. I wouldn't even be trading the yellows because it's going to give you the opportunity. Um, so here I would be trading um, in a lot more aggressively and then putting stops just below here. Um, and, you know, I'd be just almost what I would consider scalping. Um, Makes sense. So it's and, time frame, but, but that's how I'm doing it. Gotcha. And uh, there's a question about whether you incorporate volume into your analysis at all, because I, I see it's not on your chart. So um, it's, it'd be interesting to know whether you, you ignore it all altogether and just look at the price or uh, you do consider volume and, and volume analysis as well. Short-term day trading S&P, yes. Yeah. Short-term day trading NASDAQ, no. You know, I mean, it's like, it depends on the market. You know, right. When I'm trading NASDAQ, I, I, I really don't look at the volume as much. I don't, and price doesn't matter as much in there. My ranges are so wide that I'm like, okay, yeah, somebody bought a bunch here, sold a bunch here, um, or there's a lot of volume in this area. Intraday, it really depends on the market. Like if I trade treasuries or S&P, yes. A lot of the other markets, no. Um, crypto, I don't, because there isn't a centralized exchange for crypto. So right. I don't really look at volume on this. And I'm also positioning on a wider time frame. I don't. I, I do think that volume matters in, in definitely certain instances in my in my strategy. Like go back to last year when the S&P was breaking and we had COVID. Uh, right. You know, that originally happened. I was looking at volume uh, religiously and seeing how we were trading on the breaks, on the rallies. And then I'll incorporate volume profile or, or volume tools. Perfect. And we've got a question here from Joseph. Uh, when the breakout occurs... Uh, do you hold until the upper band starts to turn down and does he have a stop once he initiates the breakout? Okay. So that's, that's a really good question. So like for here, exactly what I did was at this point, I was long a position right here uh, in Ethereum. Okay. And I had been kind of carrying along the whole way. And what will happen is I'll get in, cover some, breaks back to yellow, buy those back, gets to red, sell those out and try to keep the ones as long as I can. Um, so when it breaks out, like right here, I kept the entire position until this point right here. So I held it through that whole thing. And that was gotcha. very difficult for me. Uh, you know, I mean, because I'm watching it almost a 4,400, you know, I ended up selling it well below that. I mean, five, 600 points below it, but what are you going to do? I mean, you never know. Otherwise, if I would have originally sold it all, I would have sold it right here at 2,700, you know? So I look at it and go, this is, that's the hardest thing for me. Mm -hmm. It's been the hardest thing for me is when this starts to break out and I've got that position on, I've already trimmed some, I, I don't move my stop up. I don't, right. the only time I'll trail my stop is I'll move some daily moving averages up just to take off maybe some of it, but not to cover the entire position. This, this is more of a trigger for me. I will use some daily moving averages like a 10 day. I'll keep the 10 day up, which I did use that as well. And that actually coincided at the exact same price. Um, right. Once we started to violate it there, I'm like, there's confirmation. I'm like, this thing could be t done for a while. So that's how I do it. Right. And do you have a sense of kind of your, your batting average, average gain, average loss, average holding period uh, for this type of strategy? Well, for, so for right now, most of the longer term stuff that I'm trading, sorry for the background noise. Uh, oh, no problem. No problem. I'm at home. Uh, so for the crypto stuff, like um, it, it's different because it's hard to say because I'm in and out of so many different positions around a core position. So if you go back and right. look at it and say, when did I first start buying Ethereum? Well, I first started buying it here. And did I have any idea it was going to be up here? No. Right. But I just kept following what it was doing. So there's been times where I've, you know, if you look at this since I've been long, I've been long this entire time, I still have the ones that I bought back from here. And I haven't covered that initial position, but there's been a few trades around here where I've got like, like in this area where I just was like, every one of them I bought, I was losing on, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't really have that on that. Now on my intraday stuff, um, I mean, I'm usually probably right close to 40% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I won my best year ever, which is pretty interesting, was just over 30 something percent of the time. Mm -hmm. It was the best year I ever had. And it's because I believe that when I'm right, I take as much out of it. So I might get nickel and dimed a bunch, but like this right here, this move, which I've learned to, you know, try and keep, that really makes up a lot for it. So I don't look at how much I'm right versus I'm wrong as much. I don't really follow that as much as I used to. I do look at it uh, on my S and P and Nasdaq stuff because I want to see, you know, I want to start tweaking things uh, mm -hmm. to see how I am. But 
in a nutshell, that's what it is. I, I don't, I don't follow that is super, super closely. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, it's, it's important for people to remember, like, it's not all about, it's definitely not about being right all the time with your trading. Uh, somebody who's 90%, uh, who has a 90% plus bang average might be lying or, or they just might have a strategy that's super quick, but um, you can be super successful with a very low batting average. If you keep your risk as low as possible and try to stretch for those big moves um, as you showed Anthony. And uh, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, and we've got a good question here. What's your kind of reference signal for crypto? So I guess, um, I guess kind of market indicator, relative strength versus Bitcoin, that type of thing. I don't look at, the, I mostly am in trading Ethereum and I trade a bunch of uh, little coins. <laughs> right. Um, but I almost only trade Ethereum. And the reason is because I believe that there's a true story behind it. I believe that there is use case uh, yeah. this is for it. So I, I really don't even trade Bitcoin uh, yeah. or I don't even look at any of those other things. I look at this and say, there's a theme behind this. I'm trading this not the same way I would trade oil. Like right now, the two markets I'm trading the most are oil and Ethereum. Number right. one for oil, because it's in a primary trend. I think there's a lot of reasons supporting it fundamentally behind it. Um, so I look for technical reasons, very similar with this. Um, so for me, I just look at the technicals and I use my strategy just to guide my way along. It keeps holding yellows in the, in the first light blue. We can't get to a bottom light blue at all. Yeah. <laughs> so I keep saying to myself, why am I stopping this? You know, right now I feel like it's getting a little rougher and tougher, but you know, the good news is, is that it's worked in the past and, and maybe this next one doesn't work, you know? Um, but I mean, I'm really focused on what, how I see it through this. And until I think that story changes, getting back yeah. to what I'm looking at, I, I don't have a trigger for that. Uh, like uh, the story has to change in Ethereum. Right, right. And the way you, you interpret your system, the, the trend has to change, meaning it hits that lower blue. That makes perfect sense. Exactly. And all of a sudden, like this area here, and you know, you're not seeing that on uh, possibly yet, but if we start to come back down in here, right. this is why this 2300 is so big to me. If we start coming back down in there, this Bollinger Bank can start looking like this, and yeah. now you have lower lows in Bollinger right. Banks. Right. Everything is in context, for sure. Uh, yeah. we've, got, we've got another good question here. Um, uh, this is from Barry. So on the ETH chart today, uh, pricing is at the upper blue. Are you buying? If not, what's your parameters for buying in, for example, today? And obviously everything is completely educational. We're not giving out advice here. Uh, you have to pra practice risk management and, um, and follow all the proper protocols. Yeah, absolutely. And it, today it's at this blue area. And like, for me, I have just been working bids over the last week or so, you know, waiting right. for it to come back blue. I mean, and, and until I start to see it, I mean, where I always say, well, where am I wrong before I'm getting in? And this goes back to like, I'm averaging back to ones that I've had from back here, but let's just say I were to start an initial position today. I would really just use this low as my lean now. So I would say, how much can I afford to lose? If it, if it takes out that low, that's how big I would be trading here. And if it takes out that low, I'm, you know, I'm covering it. I mean, cause I think that I would, there will be another opportunity to get back in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for me, I, I'm just, I'm in accumulation mode right now because it, this is no different than what I've seen a bunch of times in the past, make a new high, come back down, consolidate for periods of time around light blue uh, and just below yellow until eventually it goes back up. So mm -hmm. that, that's just how I'd be playing it. Perfect. And we've got a question here. What do you follow? Um, what do you follow more trading rules versus trading instincts? And maybe this is a good transition to the presentation you prepared as well. So yeah, let me go. Let me let's transition to that. Um, I'm gonna actually. So I stopped the share, but let me. Yep, I'll let you know when uh, when we can see it. Okay, so okay, share screen. And yeah, keep the questions coming, guys, um, in the chat because we'll we'll have plenty of time for Q and A as well. Um, yep. Just came up, Anthony. We're all good. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. And so uh, this only it. takes me a few, this is, this is something I wrote. Mm -hmm. I literally wrote this on my trading cards, uh, probably almost seven, 17, 18 years ago. Okay. Maybe even longer at this point. Time goes by so damn fast. But anyway, I was following so many traders and I would go up to these traders and I would say, what are your rules? And I had this big long sheet of rules and I would sit down at my computer and I'd have all these rules and my brain was so mixed up and messed up because I'm like, oh, don't buy on the open or don't do on this or don't trade this. And all of a, I'm sitting there going, I can't, this is screwing me up. This is, this is not how it's supposed to be. How could these great traders 
have all these rules. There's no way in the heat of a moment when I'm sitting there, I can even remember them all, let alone implement them. So I said, Anthony, you're done with rules, not rules. I have rules for my strategy, but for my trading, I needed instincts because instincts to me, when I'm at my screens, I know exactly what I'm doing. You know, it's gotta be, I don't care if you're long-term, short-term, it's gotta be instinctual. That's the way I feel about it. So instinct number one, something I think about a lot is just be yourself. First thing I said, because all of us, look at everybody here today is listening to myself, a bunch of other uh, really much smarter than me people out there and explaining their strategies. And I look at that and I say to myself, okay, that's important to learn from them, but no one's going to be like any of us. And the key is, is for me, when I was coming up was going, look at just be yourself, learn from others. But if you try to be like someone else, you're screwed. And I said, ask yourself this question, how much am I willing to risk per day per trade? If you don't know that answer, you shouldn't be trading. I always put that there because it's like, at the time I wrote that, everybody was making more money than me. So therefore, all of a sudden I'd be trading more and I'd be losing more. It didn't mean just because I traded bigger, I was going to make more. So that's why I put that question there. And it's just a reminder of myself, be yourself. You know, trade according to risk. Go back to that question some, somebody just asked about Ethereum. I knew where I would be getting out before I'm getting in. So the number one thing that I look at is not really the entry, like 2300 is important to me in Ethereum. Yeah, that matters. But what really matters to me is where am I wrong in this position? It's the only thing I think about at this moment. I have no idea if it's going to make a new high. I have no idea if it's going to go back to my neutral. I, I don't know any of those things. But the only thing I do know is if it starts breaking uh, below that low and I start seeing lower lows in Bollinger Bands and I start to see that, start, that trend start to change, I don't care what the theme is behind the scenes, I have to get out. Know where you're getting out before you're getting in. It's the only price that I truly need to know. And it also determines how much I can trade because I always look at the position and say, and people say, well, how big do you trade? Well, it's trade according to the, the risk price. And I'm going to be able to trade. Um, the position size is going to be dependent on how far away we are from the stop. The wider the stop, the smaller, you know, the, and the closer to the stop, the bigger I can trade and risking essentially the same amount. Um, now, instinct number three, always be a student. I mean, that's what we're all here for, right? I'm listening to all of these other uh, great people and traders out there today. I want to learn something from them. And it's important to me to always learn something. And I've taken so much of what I've learned from podcasts. I know, Richard, you're doing an excellent job with your podcast and the stuff that you're doing on YouTube. I take little bits and pieces from what I learned from uh, those traders talking about it. Uh, and, and I try to see how that would fit into my world uh, and my strategy. So I just feel like you always have to be a student. You know, humil humility goes a long way in this business. I mean, I'm, I'm, this is my 26th year in this industry, 25th, 26th year, and 22nd year as a trader. And I think to myself, every day I wake up with like that, that fear, I'm not going to be able to make money anymore. And that drives me to want to learn more. So I feel like I, the more I'm on top of learning, uh, the better my career has been. Um, react with reason. You know, I, I mean, nowadays, it's funny when I wrote this, it used to be because I saw another trader in the pit or I heard somebody say something, uh, you know, around the floor. Uh, this is, the, you know, we're looking at this. This could happen today. I go and act on that. You know, nowadays with Twitter flying around and people putting tweets out and, and is that a reason to trade? So that's an instinct. You know, I mean, a lot of people instinctually want to be at the screens when the market moves because something has been said. React with reason. I mean, it's just, it's, it's called common, common sense, a lot of it, right? And save, save that mental capital for when you really need it and your real capital for when something really lines up. And instinct five, funny, I got a lion here uh, for, for trade lion, but um, be aggressive. You know, I think this is so important because when I know something's working, going back to like my best year, it was like 30 something percentile of, of my, uh, was my win rate. I took a bunch of losses, but when I was right, I hammered it. I hammered it home. I mean, and I look back and I say, I, that taught me so much about myself. I'm like, Anthony, you could be wrong for months or you could have a lot of losing trades, but when you're right, you're going to take from the market. And that really built up a lot of my confidence. Uh, and, and it really just started making me feel more uh, like, you know what, when the situation presents itself, just take advantage of it. And when it's not, don't worry about it. You'll make up for that um, when the times are right, when the times are hot, and then do what you set out to do. Yeah, and that's the point. I mean, you think about a lion, they sit around and they don't just go and hunt something when there's 
nothing to hunt or where they don't think that they have an opportunity to actually win and, and go for the kill. I mean, that's kind of the point, right? You know, they know when to be aggressive. They're not aggressive when they shouldn't be. They don't waste that energy. You know, get out of losers. Sounds simple. We all go through it. I mean, even with that, when I go back to that ETH trade, you know, I waited a little bit and it cost me like 150 points. <laughs> it was a matter of, you know, I'm like, man, you should have just took these there. I mean, what are you even doing? I waited just a little bit, but then, you know, instinctually, I just said, you're, you're done and you got to get out uh, a, a portion of this position. We all go through this, but, you know, like I said, or, or a little bit, um, I said, the only price that matters is me. Where am I getting out? And, and when you, when you get to that price, just get out, get over it. You know, I mean, it's amazing how much better I felt. And I even go back, I've been doing this forever. It's one of my instincts. I still make this mistake where it's like, I know I want to get out here. Uh, you know, and sometimes in crypto, I'm not working hard stop. So I have to watch it and monitor it. And you're like, eh, maybe they'll come back now. And next thing you know, I'm paying uh, or I'm selling it at a worse price. Instinctually, we just got to just get over that and just do it. And once I was out, I felt so much better because it was 300 points lower <laughs> within the next day. And so, I mean, get out of losers. You know, never let winners turn into losers. This is a weird, this is a uh, kind of a weird uh, rule or instinct I wrote, I should say. And the biggest thing for me when I thought about this was I would be up money so many times or I would have these winning trades that I um, would just turn into losers and it would just drive me nuts. And I'd be like, if I just started taking all my winners, uh, then I would be all of a sudden, you know, I'd be making more money, obviously, but I wouldn't be going through this massive amount of frustration. So I just started scaling. Basically, once the market gave me what my first, you know, that's why I put together, it goes back to the Bollinger Bands, why I put in those targets. Um, you know, once I got something close to equal risk versus what my reward was, I would start taking off that position. And I wrote this, uh, you know, take half off. When I'm intraday trading, this is much more relevant. On swing trading, it's, I do it a little bit differently, but um Take half off, uh, take some of the risk out of that position, give yourself an opportunity. You never think you're going to get an opportunity to buy something again or sell something, and you do. Uh, I mean, sometimes I don't think that that's the right thing to do. It depends on the reaction. But the point of the matter is sometimes I'll hold a full position. But the, but I just, in my mind, when it is set up to do that, then you've just got to do it. It's an instinct to me. You know, no one to stop. I'm one of these guys, and I know that probably a lot of you are, are, are just like me where you'll just sit there and you'll just watch this stuff all day and you'll burn yourself out. It doesn't matter. You're just going to wake up and trade. We love this business. We're junkies at heart, you know, with this, this is what we do. We love it. I mean, and I just didn't know how to walk away and a, it, it ended up hurting me in my life. Some people may know the story about me, but at 36 years old at my screens, I had a heart attack. I was just burned out and I wasn't even really losing money at the time. I was just burned out. Go to the doctor. The doctor's like, what the hell's the matter with you, Anthony? You know, there's, you have nothing wrong with you physically, but you had a heart attack. You know, not going to get into all that right now, but the point of the matter is, is like, you know, you got to know when to stop. The market, you can't force things to, that aren't there. And I know a lot of people are going to talk about that today, wait for the setup, but it's just instinctually, you know, when you shouldn't be trading. It could be an argument with, you know, your, your spouse, it could be anything. You know, recently my dog uh, has had some issues with it and it's like, when it's on my mind, and, and she's not feeling well, I, I can't trade. I just know to be step away, man. I'm going to make a bad decision or I'm not going to make a good one. And I'm not the right state of mind. You know this instinctually, make that decision, know when to stop. Last one's be disciplined. Everybody talks about this, but the whole point of being disciplined is putting the work in to know what to be disciplined to. And I think that this is the biggest mistake that people make is that when they talk about being disciplined as they just say just be disciplined you know i i asked so many traders what their number one rule is or what if they what would they say to themselves or what the advice they give other traders they say be disciplined but nobody would know what, what what i should be disciplined to how would i know what you should be disciplined to you have to put together your process your entire everything that you look at and be disciplined to that because that's when you put the time in with a clear mind be disciplined to that and, and all those things that you put in together and instinctually you just have to know that in the moment and you just have to it has to become part of you to where you're where the market is doing something or something's happening that you instinctually know you don't need a rule for that you just need to have an instinct um so that's my nine instincts <laughs> why the number nine came up i don't know but that's just what it was perfect thanks so much um, and uh, I'll ask for any questions on those instincts. I think that's a great presentation you just went over. And um, we had some prior questions about um, going back to the trading view, if you want to bring that back up um, about sure. your indicators. Um, so 
So one of them was related to the 10 day exponential moving average and how you use that. So uh, the question was, Anthony, the chart on ETH um, on the blue line under the 10 EMA, do you still buy? On the blue line, yeah. I mean, the 10 day, I mean, okay. In, in this particular trade, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, I think everything has to be in context, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason on this trade, I yes, is because I went back and looked and, you know, when we go back and we do homework, you, first of all, you're not going to get a retracement without being below a moving average. So what I look at is this is a, this is an area where if I have a core position on, um, or let's just take it from a starting position, this would only be a smaller starting position to me um, because we are below the 10 day. I would still be buying there because when I went back and looked at what we've done um, in uh, ETH, I, I don't know, I, I get rid of my, my tools for a second. Oh, there it is. It's right there. Um, and every time we've been coming back in like this scenario, like similar to here, okay? Similar to here, okay? That these have been, you know, where we're not getting too far away from it. You nibble. It starts getting back above it. You know, I could always add. I mean, another question might be, do I add to winning positions? All the time. I'm an aggressive adder to winners. As long as they're within my area in here, like in this situation, if we're down below this area in, in ETH, I'm buying. I mean, I might buy, you know, we start holding above the 10 day. Like I said before, I've been, I got chopped up a little bit here because we were below the 10 day. That also caused me to puke some early. Then I added up in here. And then now I'm kind of just trying to average them out. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a commitment to it and uh, you know, it's holding it. So, you know, nothing's perfect, but when I'm like, doing a longer term accumulation trade, yes, I'm doing that on the shorter term stuff. Eh, maybe, you know, it would be, I, I may not be doing much there. Yeah. And do you have any specific rules um, or it could just be instinct about risk management because um, uh, some of the things you've talked about, it's a little bit of a feel thing, which obviously you develop more over time. Uh, but do you have any kind of hard rules about um, setting stop losses, any of that to manage your risk and make sure you're protected on the downside? So a couple things. Number one, intraday always have a set. I always have a set amount of risk per trade. I have a right. risk per day. And right. I, my stop is much more structured, okay? When I'm in a longer term swing position, there's just, I look at numbers like mattresses. They're going to bounce off of them. You know what I mean? They're going to be a little bit of gift. And I just can't be so tight with it. And, I, and with crypto, I'm not using stops um, or trailing stops. Sometimes I will put some stops and some of these, uh, I have a few accounts to where I, they, some of them allow it, but some of them don't. And right. nonetheless, but uh, intraday, the structure is what am I willing to risk per day? What am I willing to risk in a trade? Uh, and that will also go over to a week uh, or a month. So for example, and I want to say this because I think this is important. So for example, let's just say for the month, I'm willing to risk $10,000, okay? And I'm day two in, in, in the month and there's nothing going on. Uh, and I might that day only risk $500. The next day, uh, the market's really busy. And I say, look it, there's a lot going on here. I might risk two, $3,000, maybe right. more because that day is representing it. So it's also going to be moving based upon what's happening in the market. I've talked about this. I mean, one of the things that I've really figured out uh, well, about myself is that I know I'm going to get chopped up. I know when it's happening. I feel it. I'm in there. I'm doing, if I'm clicking buttons, I'm getting chopped up. I'm done. But the minute it, it, everything is working for me, I just turn into a different mode and I'm going and I'm like, this is, I'm taking more because, and sometimes it blows up in my face. It does happen, you know, and it happens more than I want it to, but, but that's how I, that's how I end up capitalizing. on. Right. And here we've got a really fantastic question. Um, I, I love talking about this with traders. So uh, Tony, what is your daily routine and what practices do you do to keep your mind sharp and narrow your focus? Or does it just come with time and experience? And do you have any tricks to calm yourself down in the heat of the trade? I'll answer the last question first. So sure. calm myself down, breath. Yeah. Breath is number one for me. And that is before I came on to speak with you guys today, breathe, get the air in. I didn't know this until I actually sat down and I started to uh, talk with people, uh, you know, professional people I have 
uh, a nutritionist, a, you know, functional <laughs> uh, medicine doctor that I go to. And, I, and, I, and I'm fortunately to be able to do some of these things. But I sat down with them and they'd be like, listen, you, you know that when you're trading, you're in the heat of the moment. I didn't learn this till you know, several years ago. Um, you're not breathing. You know, I suffer from anxiety. I've had it in the past. It drives me crazy. You know, like the Tony Soprano where I'm like, am I going to pass out? I've never passed out, but I've also been to the point where I'm looking at it going, I'm, I'm going to crack here. This is going to happen. Right, right. And it's really, and, and I never went to see, I would just always exercise, do whatever. Obviously I had a heart attack and started doing more things in my life to, to focus on this, but breath was key. Um, knowing that I'm actually taking in breath uh, while I'm watching and trading uh, has been a huge difference for me. And it calms me down tremendously, just feeling uh, the breath come in and out and hearing it. And there's a lot of exercises you can do. Routine to me is, I actually did a video on this. I could drop a link and what my mm -hmm. preparation is, but a quick little um, to talk about it is I like to ease my way into the day. I am up way before I start to trade. I get up, I read. First thing I do is read because it gives me something that I have to focus on. When you watch TV and news, it's just, it's, it's noise in the background. I don't really listen to the news that much anyway. But for the most part, I like to read news or read a book or something because it keeps me focused right then and there. Before I have coffee, anything, I'm looking at it just reading. And it helps me just get my mind set. Then I come in and I make myself a healthy breakfast. I'm really big on Bulletproof. Uh, some of you may or may not know uh, about that. I, I have that cookbook by David Asprey. I think it's great. Um, so I eat a lot of Bulletproof type stuff. Um, and from that point, uh, after I spend the time making my breakfast, uh, and I put everything together. I make my drinks, you know, everything I do. Now I'm sitting down at the screen and, and I'm mentally ready. I don't need a ton of preparation anymore for trading because I know exactly what I'm looking for. And a lot right. of that preparation is done at night. So right. when I sit down in the morning, it's like I can look at the screen for five minutes and go, I know if I'm doing something or not. Makes sense. And we've got another question here uh, from Sean. For Anthony, I noticed that Ethereum... Um, has failed clearing the rising 50-day moving average over the last several weeks. Is that at all concerning on something like this, or is it not part of your process? It, it's not. I mean, actually, let's pull up the 50-day. I mean, let me take a look at it. I mean, I don't have it up. I don't look at it. I mean, I do sometimes. I'll pull it up on one of my other charts. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I look at it and say, you know, look, at. I think that there's, I want to be proven wrong here, so I know I should be getting out of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. It's like I, I'm not some of these people who's I don't hold on to anything too tight. I mean, if I, if I found reasons to why I should stop stop holding ETH, I'd be covering them. Believe me when I tell you, I don't want to hold anything I don't think is going to work out. And and I look at it and say I could pull up a bunch of things on here that would start confusing me and making me feel like I should cover. That's why what you see is what you get, and that's why when I go back and look at it, and you go, I go back to the same thing where have we been holding yellows this whole year? And, you know, every time we've been hitting light blues in the past, right there, they've been holding. You know, this is the only place this year I've gotten chopped up beneath. You mm -hmm. know, and now we're back to holding. Does it hold the next couple of days? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. Then maybe I start trimming my position again. You know, but I, I can't confuse myself and look at something else and be like, oh, man, this 50 days holding now, man, I'm toast. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Yeah, perfect. And we've got a question here from um, In The Money, Ben. Uh, what platform have you found that gives you the tightest crypto pricing? I have TD and can only trade Bitcoin futures, which has too many fees uh, to actively trade. Um, well, I have several crypto accounts and I'll, I'll explain why I do. Uh, number one is when I'm doing this in the longer term, this is all another reason why I really don't day trade it. I don't, I don't short crypto, mm -hmm. um, but I, I have multiple accounts. And the reason I do is because Trading around a core position, number one, I want to be able to spread it out a little bit. I have uh, Coinbase, I have um, Binance, um, I have TradeStation, which you can connect to TradingView, which I do sometimes connect to this, and I'll and I'll use TradeStation on TradingView, uh, which is really nice because it connects directly to my equity account. So TradeStation, I think, is probably the one that I would re recommend in, in that you know if you want to be able to trade equities and crypto, um, I, I use that. 
Um, and I have a couple other smaller ones. I have MetaMask. And the reason why I did that is because I was actually all in Coinbase at one point in time. And I remember all of a sudden I saw it was cracking and I didn't have a stop in and I went in and I went to try to cover it and the freaking thing was down. And right. I'm going, this is complete nonsense. I said, this will never happen to me again. So I ended up going to multiple ones. And so the ones that I add, like on this specific trade right here, I will go and the minute that those aren't work, I will smash the bid and get out. And I also then know that the ones that I'm owning in there, I can kind of keep track of that. Like, cause I'll keep my core position in one account and I'll watch that and, I, and I'm not watching it and micromanaging it, but then I'll micromanage the other account and that one I'll watch to see how I'm actually trading it. And like that account right now is actually going down because I've been losing <laughs> and I could see, okay. So that's like, okay, uh, you know, you still have your core position, but you know, all of a sudden get ready. It's easier for me just to get flat that account. So right. I, I play psychological kind of games like that um, because it just helps me. I, I need the help. <laughs> Oh, makes sense. And um, we've got a kind of follow-up question to your daily routine. Um, MJ asks, what is your preparation routine in the evening and night for the next day? And uh, an add-on question for myself is, do you do any journaling and, and any of that to kind of keep in touch with your own emotional state and all that? The evening prep is really what I do is I'll sit down and I will go over longer term charts at the end of the day and really, I like to see daily closes. I like to see, you know, Sunday is actually my busiest day right. because Sunday is like the weekly closes is important to me on crypto. You know, in other markets, I'm looking also on Sunday. Sunday is my Monday for a lot of right. us. It, it is. Uh, so my preparation really is, and it's it's nothing really complicated. It's just really getting big picture view of everything. You know, uh, I, I can't say this enough that even my own indicator, I created this, like I said, I mean, a lot of times this is what I'll do. I mean, I just want to see this, you know, I mean, or this, um, what do I see here? You know, sometimes I see things, you know, and I look at it and I go, okay, what's happening in the market. This is a big part of my preparation is really, I actually put a tweet about this the other day and I was talking with you, um, about this. And I said, you know, since the beginning of 2021, I was looking at it going, okay, how long do we make highs? I'm probably going to get this on the wrong day here, but just bear with me, whatever. It was like 40 days. Okay. And then stop right there. Before we made a high, that's good. That's the wrong place. I'll find it again. Bottom line is, so a big part of my preparation is just looking at clean charts. And I start to find like different, different things happening in the market. And why am I drawing this right now? Well, because I'm drawing this because I actually found out that like the market kept making, like I said, this isn't going to be perfect. I know it's recorded, but mm -hmm. uh, you can go back and look at my tweet. And I started seeing like sequences. It was like 40 days, 40 days, 40 days where we were going consolidating, then 40 right. days of new high. And, and so a big part of my preparation is prove me wrong, Anthony, you know, with just basic charts, looking at stuff. Are you wrong? Are you, why are you, why are you in these positions? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll go to the other markets that uh, I'm, I'm looking at and I'll go and say, you know, why should, should I be in these? I mean, I go back to oil. I look at this chart every week and, and every, you know, every week I look at it and go, this thing isn't done. Right. <laughs> you know? And I just say, I just look at this and go, this doesn't look like it's done. So then I layer my stuff on there and then I go to work. Right. Yeah, for sure. And um, we've got a good question here from Andrew. Do you trade any crypto related stocks? And he says, thank you. Your presentation is awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, I don't really trade a lot of uh, crypto related stocks. I mean, I, I bought uh, the Coinbase uh, IPO. I'm, I'm down on it already. I mean, I actually was pretty patient with it too. Still bought it at a, at a bad price, but uh, that's in my portfolio. You know, I, I look at that and I, and I bought a small amount of it and I just want to own a piece of it. Um, I, I trade that. That's not really, I don't, that's not a trading. That's, that's investing mm -hmm. for me. And I put X amount into that. And I said, you know, we're going to watch uh, and how that goes. And, and, but I, I really don't, um, like I said, I, I really don't, uh, I don't trade a lot of those and I don't really trade a lot of the other smaller cryptos either. Uh, they don't have stories behind them. So Ethereum has a story behind it. So I'm kind of like playing off the story and I'm playing off of other cryptos that are playing off of ETH where there's stories. And that's just little smaller amounts of money. Once again, I allocate it accordingly. And right. I want to get back to the question you asked me, Richard, which was like, do I journal? Mm -hmm. And the one thing I do do is I keep a notebook with me everywhere I go. It's right next to me right now. And I journal uh, these days a lot more of, I used to be much more of an active intraday trader. I'm now basically only actively intraday trading when it's busy. When, mm -hmm. I, when I just look at it and go, I can't walk away from this today. Um, a lot of what I'm doing now is working on 
longer term positions like crude oil. I'm trying mm -hmm. to build a position in that still I've been trading around a long right now. I uh, just can't seem to trade it the way I want to. But, uh, you know, I'm trying to do things like that uh, more, but I'm keeping notes of things along the way and, and really journaling what I'm seeing in the market and why I'm why I go back to like my Ethereum theme. You know, I went and looked at my notes even before I came on today. It was like, you know, the visa story, Goldman about the bonds, I keep seeing things pop up in headlines, mm -hmm. you know, and I go back to crude oil. If I'm listening to somebody in an interview, um, you know, listen to a macro podcast and they talk about oil, like right in out there. I do more of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love uh, you mentioned a few times that you're you're always looking for to learn something new. And you just mentioned a bunch of different sources. You like to listen to podcasts, all of that. So, yeah, I, I'm the same way. I'm just kind of a sponge trying to pick up different edges from different traders. So, yeah, that's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, Michelle asked, do you own any Ethereum or any other crypto or do you just trade it? When you say own, well, I mean, I own ETH in a sense, like there's some of it I'm not, I'm not going right. to cover unless it goes back to my pricing, you know, so we'll see how far that goes. I mean, unless we were to explode on it, like out of nowhere, and then maybe I'd probably sell almost all of it, but I plan on holding a, a, a decent amount of it. You know, um, I, I own Bitcoin. I mean, I, like I said, I have a bunch of other cryptos too that, uh, you know, um, that I own that are, uh, small little ones and I, I look at them and I and I found stories behind them. I mean this one pirate coin I bought and I looked at it because it's really private uh private coin. It's very uh, there's a lot of privacy behind it. And I said, you know what, that's interesting. Right. I allocated some money there. You know, it's like they were I watched this video where this guy was like, you know, you're gonna be able to use it on your phone and then you're just gonna be able to like scan a code and it's it's like this black thing on your screen and um you'll be able to transfer money that way. And I was like, that's a pretty cool story. Put some money mm -hmm. in, you know, I mean I'm losing on it. A lot of the ones I'm in, actually, I'm down on. There's a couple that I'm up on. But I look at those as just allocations. How strong is the story? Okay, I look at the charts a little bit. I say I work a bid, and mm -hmm. I use the charts to help get me in, and that's it. Um, and then I go back and evaluate them. This is what I do on Sunday. Right, right. And uh, just in general, um, cr crypto is something that I, I haven't treated, actually. I, I'm still pretty much pretty ignorant to, to all, the, all the themes going on. I know Ethereum has a smart contract and NFT and that seems very promising. Um, but in general, I haven't really gotten involved. So it's always great to hear with somebody who's a little bit more interested in that than myself and, and learn something new. Um, we've got a question here from, uh, from someone. Does Anthony trade ETFs or just futures like oil? Almost only futures on the intraday stuff, uh, like oil. So for example, let's just use oil here. I, I don't yeah. I don't want to be in the ETF for oil. I will only want to be in the futures. Will I trade the ETF for some other things that I want to be in? Sure. I bought like this commodity ETF earlier in the year because it was like a commodity basket. So instead of me trading some commodities and right. trying to manage that position, I went to an ETF. Uh, and those I do trade because those are swing positions. Crude oil specifically to me, I'm actually looking forward to the micro crude oil, crude oil coming out, uh, which will be coming out next month, which will be one tenth the size of the WTI. And I like that because I like to scale in and I like to be in swing positions in crude oil. You know, crude oil news the other day, you know, I was able, I saw the break. You know, and it was like, I wanted to step in and buy some, I waited, ended up upticking on me. And I'm like, now I'm kind of like, you know, stuck where I can't get in it and, right. uh, and more. So, I mean, what micros, I would have been able to do that. I mean, that's kind of the benefits of like the ETFs. They could be smaller and you could scale your way in. Futures have now come a long way. And that's why I mostly focus on them. Plus the 60, 40 tax gain. Because I'm, if I'm active in it and you have a good year, you pay 60% long-term capital gains, 40% your schedule C. So you get right. a tax break there. So that's why I like futures for those products. You know, I trade NASDAQ, gold. Like I don't want to go old into GLD. When I want to trade gold, I buy gold. Right. Um, when I want to trade oil, I buy oil. And most of these days, just to make it clear, I trade four, four or five markets, gold, crude, and futures. NASDAQ, Russell. A gotcha. Little bit, a little bit of 10-year ultras. And that's not often these days. Perfect. And we, we've got a question here. Uh, what resources do you listen to to get this conviction? So I guess, I guess the question is, uh, do you have any recommended podcasts, books, all of that uh, to help inform yourself about these different markets? I, you know, you know what I use the most is Twitter. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that a lot of us do. And I like Twitter because I follow certain people and then I go and I do you know, behind the scenes. I mean, I listen to a lot of counter arguments too. You know, I don't, I don't want validation of my ideas. You know, a lot of this stuff I look at and I say, I see these, uh, you know, I put all these different things I saw come out. Like I remember, I remember the visa thing with, with uh, 
Ethereum like it was yesterday. And like Visa is going to start allowing you to use USDC on Ethereum to pay off your debt. Right. You know, myself, I'm like, man, I started looking for reasons as to say, why is that not good news? Right. And so that, I found that on the Twitter headline and I went and read stories on it. And, you know, and, and I go down these paths. Do I have anything specific? No. I mean, I think it's like, you know, you follow good people. I mean, I look at like, you know, I, there's a few people that you interviewed and followed their, uh, I followed their shows. And then I went and see, you know, who do they follow? And then right. well, I, to me, that's kind of what I do. And that's what I do on my Sunday. You know, I don't have a specific resource. Um, and I follow, uh, like I said, some of these big name people on crypto, uh, you know, because they have these big followings. You, you don't know what they know or, or don't know. What I try to do is I really try to go to on um, crypto side of things, especially as I yeah. try to go to the coin desks or the other places. And I try to read the, the stories on them. I think reading those uh, has helped me a lot. Perfect. And I'll, I'll actually join you on camera here to end it all, to end it off. Um, actually, we got one last question from Wright. Uh, what was the commodity ETF PS that you bought earlier this year? USCI. Right, yeah. right up here. USCI. I puked it. Pissed about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, there it is right here. Unbelievable. This thing's at 41 bucks. <laughs> yep. You know, I was long it, and then I just, I, I started to, uh, you know, I was just thinking too much about it. I actually started to buy it. I bought it right in here. Mm -hmm. Rolled this up. It came back and down. And then it started to not look good in the charts. And I started thinking maybe we're not going to get inflation. And that was one where I ended up just dumping it and allocated it towards gold, um, yeah. which was not really the brightest idea. But that's the one I bought, USCI. Yeah, we, we all do the same things. We all we all puke at the bottom sometimes. It just happens. But you got, you got a nice run of it. Yeah. Yeah, I made money on it. I wasn't hit. And I look at it and I was like, what are you going? I'm just going, oh, man. Whatever. I mean, you know, once again, I mean, I go, there's, this goes back to like, I had a story here. I started mm -hmm. to feel a little bit like in here, the theme was breaking down. I right. started, that's really part of it. I'm going, man, this thing is up here. And it's had a good move. I mean, look at where it had gone from as well. And I was looking at it going, you know, I remember this area right here when we had broken out uh, or, yeah, I said, you know, bottom line is I, I looked at it and I said, this could be done for a while. And then of course it stopped and started turning back up, but that's what it is, you know? Right. And we've got a question here. Um, how do you see gold, silver, and copper? I got a little gold right now, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm, I, copper, it was funny. I actually talked with, um, you know, gold, I think gold, I keep trading around the position. Mm-hmm. It, and I am long gold. I think it's going to try and make an all-time high. I think this break in crypto was positive for gold. I am long gold, but I've just gotten so chopped up with it this year. I'm still down it on the year because I got too aggressive earlier in the year and I'm just staying small and I'm looking at it and going, every time we get around this 200 day moving average in gold, I feel like it's it's just going to continue to probably ice, uh, you know, chop around here. Right. Do you think it's going to go up? I'm just trying to stay as small as I can or even use options to go up. So I'm, I'm actually bullish gold, but I'm cautious of it, uh, mm -hmm. of, of getting too aggressive because in the past, that's what it's done to me. If it starts to work and make new all-time highs, I'm ha happy to add. And then that would be a scenario where I put some trailing stops so I don't get caught. Copper, I can't find somebody that's bearish it, so I can't trade it. I mean, it, it was funny. I was talking... Uh, uh, with the guys from Macro Voices, Pat, Patrick Serezno was on my podcast and we were talking about it. And he's like, do you know anyone that's that's not bullish copper? I'm like, no, I'm like, I, I'm like, I, I don't trade copper anyway, but um, I, everyone is so bullish this thing that I yeah. don't know, worries yeah. me. Yeah, perfect. Um, and let's see, not seeing any more questions, but we've got some really nice messages here. Uh, love your story and journey. Thank you for sharing. Um and yeah, is, is there anything else you want to cover in this presentation or do you want to close it out? No, I'm good. I mean, I just want to say thank you to everybody out there. I love the, yeah. the, the trading community, Trader Line. I appreciate you guys so much for uh, having me on today. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we always, everybody always talks about FinTwit, uh, you know, the, the good and the bad. And a lot right. of the bad will come out on Twitter. But uh, you guys have a great group of people here presenting today. Really thankful for that. And I just want to say my DMs are open. Uh, and they're open to any questions you have at any time, whether it's about this presentation or anything. And, you know, that's it, man. I wish all you traders uh, all the best, man. Just keep grinding it out. It's what we do. Perfect. Yeah, Anthony, thanks so much for coming on and being part of the, the first, the 2021 uh, trading conference. We really, really appreciate it. And for me personally, it's great to hear about different things like commodities and, and all of that, um, because it's not something I'm trading and crypto I'm not really focused on. So 
I definitely learned something new. So I really appreciate it. Um, and with that, well, um, man, yeah, I know it's, yeah. all I do is trick crypto and <laughs> uh, commodities. It's funny. Yeah, so for sure. And that's why I'm tuning into you guys as well. I think yeah. it's, I like watching the stock people uh, and how you guys approach your business. I've learned a lot from, from yourself and a lot of these guests that today on Twitter and your podcast, I mean, you guys do a great job. Uh, and so I'm thankful for that as well. Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting because uh, I was looking at a, a silver related stock or a mining stock, Gato, G-A-T-O, which had a nice run earlier. And that's because of the run in silver and all the commodities. So it's interesting how different markets line up and all of that. Are they a miner? Uh, I believe they're a miner. They're involved somehow. I'm not quite sure of their story. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. I actually like the miners. The reason I ask is because the GDX, I actually have a little bit of that. And I, I like the miners. I think it's a better play. I think it's a better way to actually stay in the position of gold right. uh, or silver. I, I like the miner plays right now as well. So, yeah, perfect. Uh, well, yeah, for sure. Uh, Anthony, thanks so much again for giving us your presentation and sharing your methods. The, the Bollinger Bands are a great tool, especially if you kind of apply it to your own personal uh, style. So with that, um, I think we're going to take a break for lunch and we'll be back at 1.30 with Brian Shannon. So um, everybody in the chat, thanks. Uh, thank Anthony for coming on and, and sharing his style and uh, we'll see you guys at 1.30. Thanks. Awesome guys, thank you. See ya.